research is machine learning and data mining, and specifically I focus on very complex uh, relational domains where there are, you need to take into account interactions between many entities in order to make efficient predictions, uh, accurate predictions. But today I'm not really going to talk about my own research, I'm going to really try to give you a sense of what's going on in the AI community right now. There's been a lot of uh, interesting breakthroughs uh, over the last few years. There's a lot of excitement about AI. And what I'm going to try to do to, today is uh, compare and contrast two events that happened uh, earlier this year and talk to you about how to think about what's hard and what's easy in this space given those two um, uh, occurrences. So. Um, Really, I want to contrast these two recent events that happened earlier uh, in March of this year. So the first major breakthrough that happened was, um, you can see here, uh, March 15th, was the event where Google's AlphaGo system, computer uh, game playing system that plays Go, won over a professional Go player um, here in East Hill. Uh, and it was a major breakthrough for the community. It was something that uh, at least when I started in the field of AI, was something that I thought about doing. I taught myself how to play Go and realized I couldn't even learn how to play Go, let alone uh, program a computer to be able to, to play it. Uh, and so it, uh, the success happened much earlier than people anticipated. And um, so in the news, this was touted as a major breakthrough and really something that was going to transform what we saw in terms of the successes in AI. However, less than 10 days later, we had another event happen, which you may or may not have heard about in the news. So here, this is uh, March 24th. Um, Microsoft released an AI chatbot onto Twitter. It was called Tay, and it was designed to mimic uh, a young teenage girl that uh, in the AI uh, robot was supposed to interact with millennials and learn how to engage them in conversations on Twitter. And uh, this experiment went horribly wrong, if you didn't see about this uh, in the news. Within 24 hours, this uh, pleasant teenage chatbot turned into a racist, abusive, sexist entity. And Microsoft removed it from the internet uh, within 24 hours of releasing it and apologized uh, profusely about the event. Uh, and the important thing here is that uh, they didn't anticipate that this was going to happen. Um, some of the news that was uh, explained what was going on blamed us as humans for being horrible people on Twitter uh, and turning this uh, cute little chatbot into a uh, horrible mess. Uh, what you might not realize is that Microsoft didn't do this unknowingly, uh, they had a similar type of chatbot called Xiaoice that was being used for two years previously very successfully in China. And it was interacting with as many as 40 million people. And so what was really the difference between when they rolled it out in China versus when they rolled something out on the general uh, internet uh, to the general public on Twitter? That's what I'll talk about as I get um, more into these systems. But the important thing here that I want to contrast from a technological standpoint is that algorithmically in the machine learning space, there's a lot of shared technology between these two systems. So you might think that a, a computer program that's going to play Go would be very different than a, a robot that, a chatbot that is going to interact conversationally with people. But some of the, many of the methods underlying these are going to be the same. And so why was one uh, system a major success and the other a major catastrophe. Uh, to understand this, let's go back to the beginning of AI uh, to learn a little bit about the history. So AI uh, has been around for about 60 years now. Uh, so it was started as a field um, in 1956 when uh, John McCarthy, Martin Minsky, and Claude Shannon proposed to have a two-month conference, summer conference at Dartmouth to really explore and define what this field should be uh, under the conjecture that all aspects of human intelligence could be encoded in a computer uh, system, uh, including many aspects of learning. And so when they jump-started the field with this, um, with this conference, there was a lot of excitement, a lot of, uh, a 
lot of effort um, in many different directions in the field. I'll focus mostly on machine learning because that is, uh, that is my area, but there are also a lot of other areas um, uh, included in AI that I will touch on today. So the early work in the field uh, was really inspired a lot by considering how we as humans might be learning and our biological systems. Uh, one of the very first machine learning methods is the perceptron, which was invented uh, by Rosenblatt in 1958. And this was inspired by the neural connectivity of the brain. Uh, this is a mathematical model that's trying to mimic what they thought happened with neurons, where stimulus would come into the neuron and it would um, accumulate up until some point. And once it reached a threshold, it would fire a signal. And so they tried to encode this mathematically in this perceptron here. Uh, another early program was Samuel's Checkers program that he invented in 1959. It started with uh, game planes, this was one of the first game plane systems where it would formulate this uh, the problem of how to learn and how to play a game as a game tree where you have to look ahead uh, as to what the outcome of the game might be in order to decide with a strategy of what moves to play. And the methods that he used to develop this, uh, this system really were the precursors to the um, subfield of machine learning right now that is called reinforcement learning. And that, in that case, there's not an immediate signal that tells you whether you're right or wrong in terms of what decision you've made, but you have to wait for some amount of uh, uh, time before you get some feedback as to whether you're headed in the right direction or not. And that is certainly the case with games. And finally, the third thing that I want to point out here is that at the same time there was another area of AI that was focused on developing dialogue systems. And so these were the precursors to what now are being used in chatbots. And in these systems there was input from users and the, the AI system would have to figure out how to make a response to them. And one of the very first examples of uh, this as a successful system was the ELISA system, which was invented by Weizenbaum in and this was really built um, uh, as a parody, initially, of a Rogerian psychotherapist. And so what would happen, uh, what the system would do is it would interpret uh, some uh, information about what the user had put in through some pattern matching and uh, processing the language that they had uh, inputted, and then uh, picked responses based on certain templates that they had in the system. And if you were going to parody a psychotherapist, you can imagine that a lot of the answers were things like, how do you feel about that? Um, and tell me more, and things like that. And so uh, at first, when Weizenbaum created the system, he really created it to show people how um, difficult the problem of interacting with humans uh, in the AI system with humans would be. Uh, and he was actually surprised at how many people actually were fooled into believing that this was a, this was a human. And so really this was the, uh, this jump-started work in that field. So, let's see. Okay, so how do these basic systems work? Uh, let's uh, consider the, the checkers scenario. Really the way that we frame these as learning systems uh, reflects how you might think of, if you self-reflected about how you yourself learn how to play a game. This is really what we put into our computer uh, algorithms as well. So if you were going to teach somebody how to play checkers, you would tell them about the board, you would tell them about the pieces and what kind of moves they can make, uh, what are the rules of the game, how do you win the game, and so on. And what you would do is you might start off by watching other people play the game to figure out uh, choices of moves, strategies in particular scenarios, or you might play yourself and lose a lot at the beginning, but eventually you would start to understand which moves were good choices and which moves were bad choices so you can improve your strategy over time. So that's exactly what we do when we put that into an algorithm. And the way